have some time for some Q and A. So looking at the questions that have come in here. Um, okay, let's start with, do companies with a global footprint have to comply? Who wants to take that question? I think if you take the US SOX example, then yes. Okay. It, it does not work with JL and all their UK enterprises and all their European businesses had to comply with that US SOX requirements. And that's been prevalent in most companies that have a US parent or a, a US registration. So I would think you, you know, if you're particularly if you're UK UK registered, then you will have to deploy globally. And I, I, I think to if we if we think that we've got things to learn from the SOX example, it wasn't just if you were US registered, it was if you raised money at all in the in the uh, at all in the US. So the, the, the fact that you weren't registered there didn't exempt you from the SOX requirements. Yeah, I mean, I would just simply endorse that by saying it's where, where are you operating? What are your global touch points? And effectively, in order to trade or raise funds, uh, what's the lowest common denominator that you need to comply with in order to satisfy that jurisdiction? Hopefully okay. That the uh, let's take another one. Um, Serena asks, do we know when legislation is expected to be finalised and passed? Well, in terms of where we're at at the moment, I mean, there is there is a process to go through. We're clearly at um, government uh, releasing the white paper and consultation. Uh, the consultation clearly is uh, now being reviewed in terms of responses back uh, from industry uh, to the government. So we now obviously are waiting to see how the government will set the response to that. Uh, and I would imagine we'd then set the timeline. Clearly, we've got two years or two and a bit years before the anticipated uh, enactment of uh, legislation kicking in. So I suspect we may see something uh, in the next parliament, um, but obviously we need to see uh, to what extent the government have taken account of um, industry's views and how they're going to uh, look at those against the, the overriding agenda of actually driving standards. Thanks, Ram. Uh, another question from James here. Do we know if the regulator will issue guidance on how to evaluate control failures, similar to guidance from the PCAOB, or will organizations use PCAOB framework as a reference? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a very good question, but I would imagine, um, like, like all regulators, uh, you know, the, the purpose is not simply there to uh, bang you over the head. I mean, that, that's a consequence of non-compliance. So actually, I would imagine that the regulator will actually set the standards and give examples and guidance on what it's expecting. So, you know, it makes it harder to say, well, I didn't know uh, on the basis that it will be published on the website. And again, we know uh, all of these uh, things will be then translated into the corporate code. So, you know, there will be a reference source and guidance. Okay. Um, and Deepak asks, uh, what will be the key question to ask to ensure the design of controls is to mitigate financial reporting misstatement and not necessarily financial loss? Where's the accountant? <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 would it would really be, you, would, you, would you make an investment decision based upon like what is controlled by this internal control? So like it, it, it's not necessarily preventing a loss. It's like if you are if you are making outrageous claims about the future prospects of this company, then you're not making a loss, but your investors might well be placing their investments on erroneous advice. It's the it's the investors that are being protected. And it's also your lending partners and other people where you might raise money on capital markets, where you can't actually afford to do it or repay it. That leads to that leads to the corporate collapse that we've seen in you know in the past. So financial loss is just a function of you know trading. But the to Nigel's point, it, it is the externals that suffer when the corporates fail, and that's where the transparency of your resilience and your balance sheets need to be need to be enforced. It, it was it was certainly the the um the management discussion and analysis was an area where signing officers felt much more exposed than they did in in just taking the financial statements the financial statements are obviously based upon account balances and 
you've got some firm ground to stand on, but you've also got to express your view as a manager on what the prospects of the company are. And oh my God, I'm going to be held accountable for that yeah. now. So there, there was much more nervousness on on that that area of the, of the financial statements. And, and there are recent examples. Just to add to that, there are recent examples of of failure in this uh, in this area. I mean, particularly Valerie from from public accounts. Um, they, overnight, the uh, the chairman discovered a, a a hole in the finances, and the reporting was that uh, cash flows are very good, but suddenly there's a 30 million apparently a 30 million pound yeah. gap in cash flow, and somebody in the in the finance team was obviously manipulating those numbers, and that's exactly the kind of risk that internal controls over financial reporting seeks to seeks to address. Similarly for Carillion, they were basically not cash flow was a huge issue. They were basically bidding for projects that were too large, going over scope, um, taking on more and more debt, giving a rosy picture. So, I mean, so, some of the, both these examples, if you actually had a solid sox like framework, I mean, arguably it would have been more difficult for them to, uh, you know, for them to suddenly fail. And these are both listed companies that one was a giant, of course, Carillion. So those are the kind of examples I think the King, Kingman and Bryden reviews had in mind when they when they proposed this. Thanks for that, Navinda. I guess it also ties back you. into it ties back into the agenda they've set in the white paper is also about the um, short termism of the incentives, where they're looking to make liquidity statements, and I think there's some stuff in there around um, balance sheets and resilience to pay from reserves. Are you paying out of operating cash flows? That is all coming in as part of the measurements that are going to be um, introduced. And yeah, that comes back to Nav's point about you know the Carillion over over committing getting indebted, failing. And yeah, that, that was all about arguably short termism on behalf of the directors, which the, the governance authority is trying to prevent again. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another one here, Hans asks, um, you've all talked about GRC technologies, what capabilities should we be looking for when looking for technology to help us? Shall I take a shot at that? Um, Go ahead. So, so, so Hans, I mean, GRC, actually the word GRC is being used in the context of so many different types of products and applications that it's genuinely confusing to the customer. Uh, um, I mean, at the moment I'm, I'm working with Safe, but in the past I have been a club where I've actually gone out and procured GRC products and you've got, you've got a challenge because one, one type of GRC product is your overarching products like metrics, you know, uh, metrics team, et cetera, where you've basically got, um, your 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 entire SOX program is on that product, and every single control is documented. Wherever folks are in the world, who's responsible, whoever is responsible for those controls, they upload evidences into that product, and you can kind of run your certification through that product. And then there are GS specific specific niche GRC products uh, like SafePass, where we're looking at ERP systems, and um, you know, doing for example, periodic recertification is a control that that is quite important in SOX, where you periodically check all the user accesses. And if you don't have a tool like SafePass, you basically are doing it on spreadsheets and 50 different people are getting 50 different emails and going through it manually, which is an absolute nightmare. So there are, there are products like SafePass whereby you, you're focused on specific IT controls, which can be automated and save you a lot of hassle. And then there are GRC products that are overarching across the board where you document your risks, your controls, your risk, you know, your entire risk frameworks on it, capture evidences. So, so I guess you need to think about as a business, you know what direction you want to go in and if you want to is there a certain products that will help you achieve your goals in a much simpler fashion um then then you kind of go for them hopefully that that gives a sense of uh, you know what what looking for a grc product might mean today thanks for that Navinda. and i think we have time for just one more um so we have a question here what about non-us listed entities in the uk that have no documentation in place to leverage on the us stocks Two years isn't that long. It isn't that long, and I think that that's the, the whole. I guess that's why we're raising the issue now and raising the awareness now, because um, if you haven't got the U.S. position to fall back on, uh, and, and and there is no corporate memory in that respect, um, then actually it requires uh, an honest review uh, internally and probably with external support as to where the business is now, uh, and starting with the end in mind. Uh, and thinking again strategically, what 